the second version, another of the same. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise, I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. Each day I rise, I will thee bless and praise thy name, time without end, much to be praised and great God is, his greatness none can comprehend. Psalm 145 verses 1 to the end of verse 8, the second of version, O Lord, thou art my God and King. O Lord, thou art my God and King, will I magnify and stand to pray. <laughs> Almighty God, it is our privilege to praise thee. Thou art the one who is worthy of all the praise that our feeble lips can muster. And we rejoice that such a mighty God invites us into his courtroom where we can come and worship and adore thee. We remember tonight that we are only able to approach thee 
through the one who is the living way. We thank thee that the veil of the temple has been rent in two, and that we have that boldly, that that boldness to enter into the holiest of holies through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that he made an atonement for all the sins of all his people, that he gave his life that ransom for many. We rejoice today that he stands on the victorious side of the cross, having overcome death, having secured everlasting life for all of his blood-bought people. And we praise thee tonight that we are able to come and gather on this Sabbath evening and to hear once again the glad tidings of the gospel. Father, we thank thee that the gospel is good news to perishing sinners. We thank thee that the gospel message uh, warms our hearts each time we hear it. Though there's many in this world and they can tire us and weary us with the repeated stories, we thank thee that the story of Jesus and his dying love for sinners is a message that thrills our souls each time we hear it. And Lord, as we come tonight, may thy word have free course in each of our hearts. May thy spirit come and make the word effectual uh, upon each of us here tonight. We acknowledge that so often at this stage of the night we can be tired, we can be weary, but Lord, we pray for thy help and thine assistance that we would be able to give full attention to the Holy Scriptures and to the preaching of thy word. We are told that it please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So Lord, even use the foolishness of our preaching tonight to do a work that will last, not just for this life, but for all eternity. We come to thee tonight, Father, thanking thee that thou hast spared us to see another Sabbath day. We can think of how many thousands and millions of people in the world have passed into eternity in the last week. And yet, Lord, we have been spared another week to sing thy praises and to exalt thee. But Lord, we pray that in the week to come, if it be thy will to tarry, that whatsoever our hands find to do, we will do with our might, that we would be those who shun sin and wickedness and ever cleave unto thee. So to this end, we pray for thy help and thy gracious assistance, that we would live holy and that we would live in a manner that exalts and glorifies our God. And may the world around us take notice that we are those who've been in the presence of the Lord our God. May uh, others see Christ in us and know that he is our hope of glory. May our lives bear testimony to the fruit of our conversion. And may we bear, bear witness of the gospel through our lips and our lives to others around us. Uh, that they would even be brought under conviction of sin. That they would come out to the meeting house. That they would hear the gospel. And that they would be brought into thy wonderful kingdom. So Father we pray for thy blessing upon our uh, gathering tonight. And remember those who can't be here. Uh, we think of those led aside with sickness and those through various reasons can't come out. Those who will tune in online, may they know thy help and thy presence even to uh, give full attention to all that is said and done in the service. And we remember particularly the Shaw family tonight, even as they uh, mourn the passing of their loved one. May thou be gracious unto them. May thy grace sustain them in these days of mourning. And we pray that even through the passing of our dear brother, uh, that thou would be pleased to use this occasion uh, to show many of the brevity of life, to show them that there is coming that day when uh, it is appointed unto man once to die. And we pray that even through this, many sons and daughters will be brought unto glory, that many would come to see that their life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. And may they indeed make their calling and election sure. So, Father, bless the, our time together tonight. May everything that is said and done bring glory to thy holy name. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. We will further sing to God's praise from the Psalm 71. Psalm 71, we're singing verses 1 to 8 of this psalm. O oh Lord, my hope and confidence is placed in thee alone. Then let thy servant never be put to confusion. 
and let me in thy righteousness from thee deliverance hath cause me escape <clears throat> incline thine ear unto me and me save psalm 71 verses 1 to 8 to god's praise O lord my confidence O lord my hope This evening is from Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, we commence reading from the verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take not on thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, 
and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thy anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for the burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea shore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz the firstborn, and Buz his brother, and Kemuel the father of Aram, and Sheshed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlap, and Be Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah, these eight. Milcah, or Milcah, did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was uh, Ruma, she bare also Teba, and Jeham, and Thash, and Makkah as well. Amen. Thus re ends the reading of the Lord's holy and infallible word. We will continue to praise God with the singing of Psalm 37. Uh, Psalm 37 commencing at the verse 23. A good man's footsteps by the Lord are ordered aright and in the way wherein he walks he greatly doth delight. Although he fall yet shall he not be cast down utterly because the Lord with his own hand upholds him mightily. Verses 23 to 30 of Psalm 37.
turn again in God's most holy word to Genesis chapter 22. We'll be looking at this passage here tonight, but if there's one verse in particular I would like to impress upon you, it's verse 7. Isaac says to his father, But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Everything had been going well for Abraham for some time. We read that he had enjoyed peace in the land with Abimelech and his neighbours around him. He now has peace in the home. His wife Sarah wanted Hagar, her maid, and Ishmael, the son that Hagar had with Abraham, out of the house. And Abraham has sent them out. But he has peace and contentment knowing that Hagar and Ishmael will be cared for by the Lord. And now Abraham and Sarah have the son that God promised to them. Isaac was the son of promise. In Genesis 15 verse 4, Abraham said, He that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Not speaking of Ishmael, the son he had with Hagar. Speaking of the son that would come forth in his marriage to Sarah. And God confirms this promise. He says in Genesis 15 verse 5. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them. So shall thy seed be. So God made a promise to Abraham. That him and Sarah would have a son. And not just a son. But that there would be grandchildren and great grandchildren. That there would be so many children born of the line of Abraham and Sarah that they would be more than the stars in the sky and more than the sand of the sea. God sealed that promise that he made to Abraham with a covenant and we can study that in Genesis chapter 15. God made a promise to Abraham and we know this about God that he cannot lie and he cannot break a promise what God has promised to Abraham here with Isaac, he will most certainly fulfill. There's many men in the world that I'm sure broke promises to Abraham. Many people who let him down. But he knew that he could trust the promises that God made to him. But this whole covenant that God made with Abraham, this whole promise, it's dependent upon Isaac being alive and Isaac producing children of his own. But now in this passage we read that God has called Abraham <clears throat> to do something. Something that it looks like <clears throat> could break the covenant. God has instructed Abraham to take Isaac up Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. Abraham would normally do that with a lamb. But God has called Abraham to do it. With Isaac. So let's look at this passage here tonight. Three headings to leave with you. First of all, notice the instruction presented to Abraham. What God has called Abraham to do. Notice in verse 1, Abraham's testing. It says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Well, why did God tempt him? Why did God test him? Were they not friends? This seems like something an enemy would try to get you to do, to persuade you to kill your son, the son of promise. This is the sort of tactic that you and I might uh, expect of the, uh, uh, the devil as he tried to destroy the seed of David so there would be no Messiah born of that line. But it's not, it's God. Why has God tested Abraham in this way? Some commentators have maybe asked the question, had Abraham reached a place of contentment in his life? By this stage in his life, Abraham is a very wealthy man. He has lots of material possessions. He has plenty of animals. He has servants to look after the animals. He's secure financially. He doesn't have to worry about working anymore. He doesn't have to worry about paying the bills, so to speak. He's also content with his neighbours. Not worried about being attacked by the Philistines. There's peace in the land with his neighbours. He's content there. 
He's content in the home. His wife, Sarah, is content. And the old saying, a happy wife makes a, a happy home. And Abraham is content there. He's not worried about Sarah. He's not worried about the problems that they had with, with Hagar and Ishmael. He can look at his son Isaac and he can see that Isaac is maturing. He's growing in body and soul. He's no longer a, a, a baby. He's not even a young child. By this stage, Isaac's in his 20s. So he's matured into manhood. He doesn't have to worry about him passing away in infancy. Isaac's now reaching that age where he'll possibly consider getting married and producing uh, the offspring to see this promise continued and fulfilled. Some commentators have suggested that perhaps in Abraham's old age, he was maybe happy to sit back, take it easy. So God calls him to take Isaac, his only son. Well, we know he had Ishmael, but Isaac is the son of promise, the son that him and Sarah had longed for for many years. The son that is an answer to prayer. The son that is in fact a miracle child. Born at a time when Sarah was physically unable to have children. And now God has called him to take Isaac. His son. The one on whom all the promises and the covenant depends. And God, I, God has called Abraham to take Isaac. To plunge a knife into his heart. But in doing so. Plunge a greater knife into Abraham's own heart. Maybe Abraham was thinking along the lines of the psalmist, has God forgotten to be gracious? He's maybe wondering, why is God asking me to do this? Well, dear friends, let me state tonight that God does not test our faith so that he can learn any more about our faith. God knows everything he needs to know about my faith and your faith. He knows tonight if you and I have no faith at all, he knows if our faith is only but a fleeting interest. Or he knows if our faith is established upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows what trials could knock your faith over. And he knows what trials could strengthen your faith. God didn't do this to find out about Abraham's faith. He knew everything about Abraham's faith. God did this so that Abraham would learn about his faith. And that's why God would have us to go through trials. He will never tempt us uh, or he'll never cause us to be tempted more than we are able. So this was Abraham's testing. But notice in verse 3, Abraham's obedience. It says he rose up early in the morning. It doesn't, didn't say that Abraham spent time doubting God's word. Did God really say that? Did God really instruct me to do that? We don't read that Abraham argued with God and said, well, God, I, I don't think this is a terribly good idea. I think there should be some other form of action taken here. We don't see that Abraham tried to delay to see if God would change his mind. He said, well, I'll do what God asked me to do, but I, I'll leave it a couple of years and maybe another plan will come into action in the meantime. We don't read that. We don't read that he went to God in prayer and wrestled with God until he got the answer that he wanted. We don't even read that Abraham had a conference with his wife and decided the best plan for it. We don't read that he went to Sarah and said, Sarah, what do you think we should do in this situation? God told Abraham to do something and he did it. That was Abraham's obedience. God spoke, Abraham obeyed, regardless of how heartbreaking the task it was to sacrifice his own son Despite how his wife would react whenever she found out, Abraham didn't factor that into the equation. God spoke, he obeyed. God called and he went. And that's the sort of obedience that God wants from you and me. In the gospel, God calls us to repentance and he calls us to believe in his son. And dear friend, we can sit and procrastinate year after year. We can make up all the excuses under the day for why we should leave salvation off to another occasion. But really, we should have the same response as Abraham. When God calls us, we obey. We do as the Lord instructs us. God's word is non-negotiable. 
It is to be obeyed entirely. And then in verse 5, we see Abraham's faith. Abraham promised his servants that both he and Isaac will return. Verse 5 says, Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Implying that they would both come again. Well, how is this going to happen? Abraham has been told to take Isaac up the mountain and to sacrifice him. How are Abraham and Isaac both going to come back? Well, the answer is given to us in Hebrews chapter 11. From verses 17 to 19, the Apostle Paul teaches us that Abraham had faith that God would raise him from the dead. That's what Abraham believed the Lord was going to do with Isaac. That yes, he would have to sacrifice him, but Abraham had faith that God would raise him from the dead. Now, there had been no history of resurrections recorded in Scripture prior to this event. There hadn't yet been the, the raising of the widow of Nairn's son or, or many others. Abraham believed in something that was scientifically impossible. He believed in something that, most, that he had never seen happen before. But he believed that God was capable of doing this. God had made a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham knew that God would not break it. Abraham had faith in God. But then notice in verse 6, Abraham's diligence. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Abraham didn't let his grief sidetrack him from his responsibility. He had all the instruments that he needed for the sacrifice. We don't see that in his grief and in his sorrow that Abraham forgot the knife. Or that Abraham forgot the wood. He had it all here. But notice, it was Isaac bearing the wood upon his back as he went up to the hill of Mount Moriah. What we see here is a, a foreshadowing of the cross. Isaac, the one who is about to be the lamb's sacrifice, is having to carry the wood of his own altar up the hill, just as 2,000 years later, the Lord Jesus Christ would have to carry the wood of his altar up the hill of Calvary, on which he would be sacrificed. We see the instruction presented to Abraham, and we see his diligence, and we see his faithfulness. But notice secondly here tonight, the question posed by Isaac. Isaac says to his father, where is the lamb. We can glean from this that Isaac had an education of what the sacrifice entailed. This was not Isaac's first sacrifice. If Isaac had accompanied his father, we're sure, many times in making sacrifices to God. He had learnt of the various items that were needed. The wood, the fire, the knife, the rope. Uh, he knew the order that all things had to be done. We understand by this stage in his life that, that Isaac is a spiritual man. Some commentators try to paint the picture of Isaac as either an unbeliever or Isaac as an immature believer. But I don't believe that's right. As Abraham and Isaac are walking up this mountain, we don't read that Abraham's in a sudden panic having to evangelize his son, having to teach his son the importance of repenting and believing the gospel and the coming Savior and Messiah. We don't read that Abraham's trying to lead his son to a relationship with God. That's not happening. Because Isaac's already a believer. Isaac's already been converted. Isaac's already walking with God. As these two men are walking, they're preparing their heart for the sacrifice. And Isaac knows there's something missing here. He's aware that the lamb is missing. The system of sacrifice, it didn't begin with Abraham. Abraham didn't invent it. In fact, I believe it can be traced all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Think about it. Adam taught Cain and Abel how to sacrifice. Abel practiced as his father taught him. But Cain didn't. 
Who taught Adam? Well, I believe it was the Lord. And specifically, I believe it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Going back into the garden, it said the Lord God made them coats of skin. So animals had to be sacrificed for those coats of skin. Who taught the system of the sacrifice to Adam? I believe the Lord did. He taught it to him in the garden. The seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. One day I will send a lamb. And the lamb will take the sins of all his people upon his own body. He will redeem them all. But until I send the lamb of God. I want you to obey the system of sacrifice. This lamb is only a foreshadowing of the lamb that I will send. Well Isaac is following in the footsteps of his forefathers. In approaching God as God demands. He knows that they cannot come to God without a sacrifice. He says to his father, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have the knife, we have the rope, but there's no lamb. And we can't approach God without the lamb. We might be able to do without the rope, but if we come without a lamb, I, I've learned the lessons of Cain, we cannot approach God without a lamb. So Isaac is very conscious of this. He knows that the shedding of the blood of this lamb points to that future sacrifice. He knows that they'll be rejected by God if there's no lamb. He's worried in case his father has, them, has forgotten or neglected the most important element, the lamb. And dear friend, can I say that the same lesson will apply to us here today? Many people think they can approach God their way. They can get to heaven their way. They think that they will be accepted by God on their terms and with their conditions. Well, dear friend, that's very simply not true. The Lord Jesus Christ declared that there's only one way to approach God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He declared, I am the door by me. If any man entered in, the apostle preached, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So dear friends, if you and I are ever to be saved, if you and I are ever to be in heaven, if you and I are ever to be redeemed and be accepted by God, it will only be God's way, not our way. And the way that God has ordained for you and I to be saved is through his Son. God gave his son to be the sacrifice in the place of sinners. He gave his son to shed his blood for the washing away of our sins. So many people, you get talking to them and they think on the day of judgment that God will put their good deeds on one side of the scale and their bad deeds on the other. And as long as the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, they think they'll be in heaven. Dear friend, we find no such teaching in the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ commenced his earthly ministry with this, this simple message. Repent and believe the gospel. And the message of the gospel is that Christ is the Lamb in our place. Well, thirdly and finally here tonight. Notice the answer provided by God. Verse 8. Abraham turns to Isaac and he says God will provide himself a lamb. Isaac's worried, where is the lamb? Abraham is effectively saying don't worry, God will provide a lamb. Abraham knows the instruction, he knows Isaac is the lamb. Of course these are prophetic words. God will provide a lamb. Because the truth is dear friend, there's no amount of lambs that you and I could provide that would ever appease the wrath of God. There's no amount of good works that you and I could ever muster that would satisfy God and take away the punishment we deserve for our sin. Nothing you and I could ever do would please God. But God has provided a way of salvation. He has provided a way that our sins, though they be as scarlet, will be as white as snow. And it's through his son. God provided a lamb in my place and in your place. As they reach the place in Moriah where Abraham has to sacrifice his son. He has to explain to Isaac that Isaac is the lamb. 
It's not recorded for us here, but I'm quite certain it happened. Quite certain that Abraham told Isaac, Isaac, you're the lamb. God told me that you're going to be the one on the altar. These are perhaps the hardest words that Abraham ever had to say in his whole life. But how did Isaac respond? Well, Isaac is a spiritual man. He knows his father to be a godly man. He submits to what God has revealed. Verse 9 says that Abraham bound Isaac his son. Now Isaac could have resisted. By this stage in their lives, Abraham's 125 and Isaac's 25. There's not too many 125-year-olds can overpower a 25-year-old. There's not too many 125-year-olds can outrun a 25-year-old. Isaac submitted. He could have overpowered his father, run away, he didn't. Abraham could have snuck up behind Isaac and killed him deceitfully, he didn't do it. Isaac is bound and put on the altar. He willingly submitted to be there. And dear friend, the Lamb of God willingly submitted to go to the cross of Calvary. That was the whole purpose of his incarnation into this world. As a babe in Bethlehem's manger, his whole purpose for coming was to go to the altar of Calvary where he would be slain for sinners and in the place of sinners. Just as Isaac submitted, so the Lord Jesus Christ submitted as well. He, he made that covenant of redemption with the Father in eternity that he would come into the world to be a saviour. He submitted to carry his cross up the hill. He submitted to have the nails driven through his hands. He submitted to have the wrath of the Father poured out upon his own body and soul. He submitted to the very death that he would die in order to redeem lost, fallen, perishing sinners. Then notice the willingness of Abraham. Verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. It doesn't say that Abraham couldn't go through with it. It doesn't say that Abraham had a change of mind. No, this was the purpose of God as far as Abraham was concerned. And he was going to do it. His hand raised with the instrument of death, his heart beating no doubt tears forming in his eyes as he looks upon his only son, the son of promise. As the Lord Jesus Christ was on the altar of Calvary, what did the father think when he saw his son there? Well, the Bible tells us. It says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. He led all of our iniquity upon him. As Isaiah 53 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Everything that was due to us was laid upon Christ. And it's by his stripes we are healed. The willingness of Abraham is met with the intervention of heaven. Verse 11. Abraham, Abraham. Twice his name is called. There's urgency, there's haste. That Abraham is to listen to. And in verse 12. We see the acknowledgement of his faith. I know that thou fearest God. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Because he feared God. Sadly today, many people don't live with even a thought of God, never mind the fear of God. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Many people will be so brazen to say that when I stand before God on the day of judgment, I'll just tell them. No, they won't. They won't. At that stage, it's too late. We live in the day of grace now. The, behold, now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Now is the day of salvation. Not a second after death, but now. 
the Lord acknowledged Abraham's faith. I know, but thou fearest God. Dear friend, if the Lord was to come and search our hearts tonight, would he find faith in us? Not just that we agree with what the Bible teaches, but would he find that we have faith that Jesus Christ was the Lamb in our place? Would he find faith that we live by faith in him? Or would he find no faith at all? Then we see the Lamb provided by God in verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham was right. Isaac wasn't going to have to die because God has provided a substitute. There's a lamb found uh, to replace Isaac. And dear friend, that's the heart of the gospel. It should be you and I facing the wrath of God. It should be you and I facing his wrath for all eternity for the multitude of our sins against him. But God has provided himself a lamb in our place. Abraham unbound Isaac. Isaac could go free. The lamb was taken and put on the altar. And so the Christian is one who has that shadow of death removed from them. They need not fear the anger of God <coughs> for their sin because God has provided a lamb in their place. Verse 13 says that Abraham offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Isaac has gone free. Christ and the ram was his substitute. We're familiar with the concept of the substitute. One who takes the place of another. We see it in football matches. One person leaves the pitch, a substitute comes on. It should be you and I, dear friends, facing the eternal torments of God's wrath, and deservedly so, that God provided a substitute. Now Abraham had not seen the provision by God. Perhaps sidetracked, maybe focused on the task before him, maybe overcome with the grief his his mind was clouded. He, he never noticed. The whole time they were there in Mount Moriah, that lamb that was there in his, uh, right beside them all along. And so it is, many men and women, they live their whole life oblivious to the fact that God has a saviour, that God has a redeemer, that God has a lamb. They maybe hear the gospel calls, but maybe it goes in one ear and out the other. They maybe read the Bible, but they do it just as a religious exercise. No, dear friend, we're not to live in ignorance of the Lamb of God. We're to live in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just as our Lamb, but as our Lord, our King, our Master. Verse 14 says, Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. That name means the Lord our provider. Now we don't just use the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, who provides all our physical necessities. But he's the Lord who has provided a salvation for us that we never merited and that we could never deserve. Many commentators believe that Mount Moriah is a special place of course, it's the place where Isaac was replaced by the lamb. It's the place where the temple was built and sacrifices were made. Many commentators believe it's also the hill that was later called Calvary. 2,000 years after Isaac was meant to be the lamb, God provided himself a lamb on this hill. I often think whenever the Lord Jesus Christ commenced his ministry and he was walking along towards John the Baptist. John the Baptist could have used any name to describe him. He could have said, behold the king of glory. Behold the almighty God. Behold the lion of Judah. But he didn't. He used the title, the lamb, the lamb of God. Now, if we were to say to the children in the playground, what animal would you want to be known by? None of them would choose the lamb. That meek, 
lowly, defenseless, in many ways helpless creature. But John the Baptist, in announcing the Messiah, called him the Lamb. Because that's what he is. It's the Lamb of God, as John said, that taketh away the sin of the world. Well, as we come to a close here tonight, Isaac asked the question, where is the lamb? And can I ask you that question tonight? Where is the lamb in your life? What place, what significance does the Lord Jesus Christ have to you? Are you able to say here tonight, he's my saviour, the one who I've come to with the repentance of sin, the one who I live in faith by every single day, the one who I love with all of my heart, the one who is altogether lovely to me, the fairest of 10,000 to my souls. Or would you say tonight, all I know about Jesus Christ is what I've read, what I've heard. I don't know him personally. I don't know him intimately. Well, if that's your response, what does the Lord Jesus Christ say? In the gospel, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're maybe saying, well, he might not take me because of my sin and my wickedness. No, the Lord says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's not one sinner who penitently and truly came to Christ that he ever rejected. The accusation was made against him. This man receiveth sinners. He's the friend of publicans and sinners. And so he is. Where is the lamb? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee that from the very beginning, Thou hadst a plan to send thy son to be a saviour and to be a redeemer. We thank thee that he gave his back to the smiters, that he shed his blood on the altar of Calvary so that we wicked, unworthy rebels could be reconciled to thee. May the lamb be precious to us tonight and every day until thy comes or goes, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We will conclude with the singing to God's praise of Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse 24. Thou with thy counsel while I live, wilt me conduct and guide, and to thy glory afterward receive me to abide. Whom have I in the heavens high but thee, O Lord, alone? And in the earth whom I desire, besides thee there is none. Psalm 73 from verse 24 to the end of the psalm. Oh,
the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.